It's the day after Christmas, and the Mariners have finally done something. So let's talk about what's on your mind following the signing of Mitch Garver in this mailbag episode of Locked On Mariners. Colby, hit it. You are Locked On Mariners, your daily Seattle Mariners podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ahoy, sailors. It is Tuesday, December 26, 2023. This is Tony Gonzalez and Colby Patton out for the Locked On Mariners podcast brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. And right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On. That's L-O-C-K-D-O-N to get yourself started. Thank you so much for making us your first listen. Subscribe, like, and turn on alerts if you're watching on YouTube or subscribe and leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform if you like what you hear. And if you're part of the crew and rock with us every single day, let us know in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. And if you want to hear from us even more, please consider signing up for our Patreon. You can now get a free seven-day trial to check out the show. The link, as well as our social accounts, is in the description of this episode. Let's open up the old mailbag and see what Mariners questions you have for us this week. We're going to start here with Mitch Garver, mega fan. That's right. Mitch Garver already has a mega fan in Seattle. Where should Mitch Garver ideally hit one through nine in the batting order on opening day? Uh, I think Garver's probably, you probably want him hitting fifth, I I think is is where you're looking at. Um, And that's not because Garver isn't, you know, one of your three three best hitters. He might be your best pure bat uh, that you have right now. Uh, The WRC plus last year would suggest that it's either him or JP Crawford. And how sure are we that JP will repeat exactly what he did last year? Yeah, we'll see. Uh, Obviously Julio is your best player, just, you know, more upside of just better overall player, but Garver on an app per app at basis is probably your best hitter right now. When you break down average on base slugging, you combine it all. He's probably your best hitter right now. So if he's if he is hitting second or third or fourth, that's totally fine. But I think in an I, ideal world, you probably have him hitting fifth. You want him hitting behind Cal Raleigh, hitting cleanup, who you know gets a little bit of protection uh, behind him. Uh, also, might allow him to see fewer left-handed pitchers because if you have to bring in a lefty to try and turn Cal Raleigh around, that's fine. But now you have Mitch Garver. Yeah. hitting right behind him who crushes lefties. So I think in an ideal world, you'd have Garver hitting right behind Raleigh. And I think again, in an ideal world, that would be him hitting fifth because Raleigh's hitting fourth and you have, I think a left-handed bat with some pop is a, a good thing to target for that uh, number three spot. Of course, the number three guy could be Julio. It could be JP. They could have a new number one or number two. There's lots of ways to build this lineup out, but I think ideally you'd want him hitting fifth, but you could totally hit him third and, and be 100% justified, uh, particularly against left-handed pitching. He probably needs to get in that bat in the first inning uh, against lefties. Yeah. yeah, I love the idea of stacking him with Cal and having him specifically behind Cal to afford him some protection in terms of matchups and stuff like that because it's really, it's pick your poison. Do you want to face lefty Cal Raleigh, which is an absolute monster? Or do you want to, you know, throw a lefty against Mitch Garver, who destroys left-handed pitching? It was like a one seventy something WRC plus this mm-hmm. past year against left-handed pitching. So, I mean, yeah, I think that's kind of like you know, living in the world of reality. That's kind of the uh, the ideal scenario uh, for you. Uh, and if you're able to build a lineup where you can comfortably push uh, Garver down into that four, five, even six spot. Uh, you've had a very good off season, I would say. Um, but look, if he ends up hitting three for you, or if he ends up hitting four, you should feel pretty good about that as well. Cause this is a guy that just hit in the heart of the Rangers lineup pretty consistently. And the Rangers lineup was insane. He hit third in the world series clinching game for them. Obviously at Garcia was hurt, you know, and, and that changed things, but still like, this is a guy that hit consistently three, four, five in that Rangers lineup. Uh, over the course of 2023. Uh, so that should really tell you all you need to know about Garver. He's one of the best hitters on the Mariners right now. He was one of the best hitters on the free agent market. You know, obviously red flags there with the health. You know, we'll have to see. That's obviously the big thing here. And, you know, his his most games played were, what, 103 games, right? So that's yeah. obviously a, a big red flag there, like we went over on Sunday after the signing. Uh, but, man, you know, you look at the numbers. I mean, of his five full seasons and i use the term full very generously here of course but it was five full seasons his lowest wrc plus 98 
after that 104 155 138 139 it's a very very good hitter and it makes me very excited about the possibility of him maybe playing 115 120 ish games like what that could look like yeah if if he was consistently playing 120 games and getting 450 500 plate appearances you wouldn't be able to afford him yeah. he would have been 20 25 million dollar a year hitter yeah so we'll yeah. see but, it's been some ridiculous output from Garver's bat over the last few years. So, yep. especially that 2019 is an insane season. Absolutely insane season. Yep. All right. Next question here comes from Connor. Can Garver and Jorge Soler coexist on the same roster? They can, but like two things have to happen. One, you have to trade Ty France. And even after trading Ty France, you likely have to teach Mitch Garver to play first base, which he's done out of 51 innings in his major league career. So he has done it a very, very tiny amount. But uh, yeah, that shouldn't really tell you anything. Um, but essentially, like Garver would probably have to be your first baseman. It's probably not going to be Soler. You don't want Jorge Soler playing more than like once a week. And even that I feel uncomfortable with in the outfield. Yeah. And Keep in mind, once a week, it's only like 23 starts in the yeah, outfield. Yeah, and I still feel uncomfortable about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the answer is not really, but not zero. Like, there is a world where they can coexist, but not really. I, again, unless unless they're wanting to teach Garber first base, which, again, you run the risk of, you know, a guy who's got a lot of catching uh, in his background, a guy who hasn't gotten, you know, 400 plate appearances in any one year, you're running a risk of losing that bat because maybe, you know, obviously playing first base, your risk of injury is still pretty low, but it's a lot higher than if you're just DHing. So you got to be really careful here. Uh, I don't, I don't see a fit, uh, with Solaire anymore. Um, again, unless like Ty said, one of two things, either the Mariners are totally okay with his outfield defense, which they should not be. Um, or they think that they can teach Garver or Solaire to play first base at at least a average clip, and they t- and they trade Ty France, but neither of those seem that likely. So I would say no, that door's probably closed, but it's definitely not a zero percent chance that it happens. Yeah, we do have a question coming up a little bit later about trading France, uh, so I I won't dive too much into that. But I think if you're trading France, you're trading him with the knowledge that you're probably getting reese hoskins rather than jorge soler like that would be uh the ideal fit there someone that's actually played first base that you don't really have to teach to play first base uh, or play out of position yeah Yeah. or 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 you know with garver right you you don't want to risk injury you don't want to risk putting him in the field too much because he just hasn't been able to maintain a fully healthy season ever in his career and at least part of that is attributed to him playing in the field mostly catching which is a very different position and a very more uh or a much more demanding position physically than first base is. but uh still you know if you can just protect him basically wrap him in bubble wrap uh in the dh spot uh, you probably want to keep it that way because his bat is what's most valuable to you. But yeah, we'll we'll talk more about the the France trade in France possibility in just a moment. But first, a reminder: this episode of the Locked On Mariners podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. Score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get one hundred and fifty dollars in bonus bets with any winning five dollar money line bet. That's 150 bucks if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use, and there's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and a whole lot more. And the Mariners might not be playing right now, but the Kraken and Seahawks are. So whether the action is on turf or on the ice, whether it's Jared McCann or Geno Smith, you can bet on it all with FanDuel. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's L-O-C-K-D-O-N and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the National Football League. And you're listening to the Locked On Mariners podcast. Thank you again for making us your first listen. And as a reminder, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube. 
subscribe to the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel part of the locked on podcast network your team every day let's get back to your questions here on a rare mailbag tuesday this one comes from m's fan juan carlos in your last episode you spoke of trading thai france how likely is that in your opinions and is it a good idea if so under what circumstances i'd like to see them give him another season but what do i know trading thai france we were just kind of talking about it so what do you think about the possibility what would have to happen in order for them to feel comfortable trading france uh, I guess a village would have to be missing their idiot. Um, no. Um, so uh, I think trading Ty France is certainly interesting. Uh, it, it's definitely something that is on the table. Uh, they're, the Mariners aren't saying no uh, to trading Ty France. They're, they're definitely going to be listening. Uh, if for no other reason, then because of the limited budget, you know, if you can trade attach his six, $7 million to a, a deal, then you can lessen the cost of the player you would bring in. And that's pretty much what you would do, right? I'm not on board with trading Ty France for prospects, right? Mm. Um, just I'm not interested in, in a, well, it wouldn't be a pure salary dump trade. Like I'm not interested in making another a Eugenio Suarez trade using Ty France this time around. So if I'm trading him, I'm trading him for a major league bat. It is a major league deal a major league player for a major league player type of deal. There could be prospects involved going in either direction, but I need a major right. leaguer back, particularly one that is a better bet to help me than somebody like Sebi Zavala uh, at the plate. The other thing is with France is that you don't have a replacement on the roster right now. Yeah. Um, you know, you, uh, Garver in theory could do it, but again, you want to try and keep Garver healthy. So now, unless you're trading Ty France for another first baseman, which doesn't make a ton of sense, uh, now you have to go out and spend more money to replace France at first base. Uh, maybe you could do that on the cheap with like Carlos Santana. Uh, but maybe it's, you have to go give, you know, Reese Hoskins $16 million a year, which I mean, totally fine. But again, now you have a little bit less money. So France, France trading France is really interesting because I guess in theory you could trade him for prospects, you know, just mm -hmm. a pure salary dump trade. And then the Reese Hoskins deal at like, 16 million per assuming he's even willing to come here is actually more like 10 million in the first year yeah. because essentially you traded Ty France for Reese Hoskins and prospects mm -hmm. would be the idea behind that. So I'm open to it. I really don't think I'm doing it um, unless I have a really good idea of who my next first baseman is. Uh, Cause as much as I love, you know, Carlos Santana and, and you know how much he would help in this clubhouse and all that stuff. Like, I don't know if I want to be my everyday first baseman unless I'm getting a really good player back in a tie France trade, which you're probably not. Yeah, you're probably not. Um, so there's a very finite amount of names that I'm actually willing to do this for. Uh, Hoskins is one of them because Hoskins, Hoskins is a clearly a better hitter. I know he's coming off an ACL. He didn't play this past year or whatever, but he's consistently been a you know 120 to 130 wrc plus guy with 25 to 30 home run potential um that's just a better hit that's a better first baseman than france even though that he's really struggled defensively and that's probably not going to get better after the acl tear but still hoskins is a better player in my mind than than francis so hoskins i would do it for uh solaire i would do it for if that means you know if they feel comfortable enough to to you know put carver at first base um obviously you know concerns about that and the health and all that stuff like we just went over in the last segment um but yeah that's those are like the two main names and then you know i ideally like we've talked about this you know ideally you would trade france for max kepler right it wouldn't just be a one for one at least in theory maybe it is but in theory it's probably not going to be just a one for one with the twins with, with france and kepler but we know that the twins sniffed around on France at the trade deadline. Um, we know that they have apparently offers in on both Kepler and Jorge Polanco. They're already trying to dump some salary. Obviously, that wouldn't be a massive salary dump for the twins if they're taking on France's salary in return for Kepler. That would only be about a four million ish dollar net loss for for Minnesota on the on the payroll. But still, uh, that's like that's the one idea that i see that i'm like cool great the mariners get better at least on paper and they get the outfielder that they need they get one of the few left-handed hitting outfielders that are seemingly available right now and they can address their their first base spot in a in a different way um 
And if that ultimately leads to like Carlos Santana at the end of it, fine, depending on what else you do. Yeah. Uh, so just to answer the question, like as plainly as we can, how likely is it? I'd say it's a true 50 50. I could see this really going either yeah. way. Yeah. Um, is it a good idea? Depends on who you're bringing in to replace Ty France and what you're getting for him. Mm. So it could be. Yeah. It could also not be. So there's a lot of gray area here. And then the circumstances, like we just said, if you have another first baseman in mind who is a clear upgrade over Ty France and you just want to move France's salary to kind of offset this bonus money that you're adding on, let's just say Hoskins, because he's the guy who's been linked to the Mariners. Then under those circumstances, I could see them trading Ty France, but you pretty much, you have to sign Hoskins first and then trade Ty France. You don't want to be again, left with, Oh no. Do we want to give Joey Votto $10 million to try and convince him to come play for us for a year? So, uh, yeah. An answer. Maybe, maybe not. And yeah, there are some, not so black and white ways to make Ty France trading Ty, Ty France make a lot of sense. It, yeah. It's a little bit complicated. Next question here from O Line Co. Other than Kepler, who are other left handed corner outfielders you think could be acquired via trade without moving Wu slash Miller? Uh, yeah, Mike Yastrzemski, Anthony Santander, but I don't mm -hmm. see the way that the Mariners get Santander or that the Orioles are willing to trade Santander without getting pitching back and it's probably like a bigger deal that involves Miller Wu but it's not just for Santander it's Santander plus Colton Kowser Santander plus Jordan Westberg yeah, Sant unless whatever. I could see the Orioles maybe salary dumping Santander he's gonna make 12 million bucks he's got one year left you can get something decent for him I could see it but not likely um other than that i could see the mariners maybe like kicking the tires on like kyle isbell but yeah depending on what san francisco is willing to do michael conforto uh, mm -hmm. is a guy uh san francisco would have to eat some salary there uh you could also go sign jock peterson Ooh. um also seth brown seth brown was yep, in our offseason plan was, yep yep so uh also somebody like you could take a shot on somebody like trevor larnick uh yeah. so i mean th there are some lefties but most of them are you're, you're taking shots right like uh lamont wade jr really He's more of really a first baseman yeah yeah so uh yeah. dalton varsho maybe um well, the Blue Jays just signed K uh, Kiermaier today. Who knows if that means they're still in on Bellinger or not. Uh, but if right. they are, maybe they're open to trading Varsho. And I think you could get him for less than Miller and Wu. It would still be expensive because despite his poor season last year, he's still an elite defender and can even play center field. And that's how the Blue Jays are going to shop him is as a premier center fielder. Uh, and, you know, 85 WRC plus, not good, but he's still a two-win player, 20 home runs, 15 steals. Yeah. like still a valuable player, but I don't think he costs Wu or Miller. Um, but yeah, it's just pure lefties. It's pretty much Yastrzemski, Kepler, Seth Brown, um, maybe somebody like Alec Burleson. It, again, if you want to take a shot on a younger guy, Burleson, Larnick, uh, somebody like that. Uh, MJ Melendez, possibly. Yeah. Uh, so th there's some, but it's not a ton. And, and uh, like without moving Miller and Wu, you're pretty much looking at one or two year guys who are making a little bit of money um, or guys who have just worn out their welcome. I don't know if Varsho falls into that, but Varsho would be a pretty interesting one, particularly if the Mariners wanted to lean into the run prevention thing mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we've kind of pitched the last week or so. You're listening to the Lockdown Mariners podcast. Thank you again for making us your first listen as we're opening up the mailbag. Got a few more questions to go over here before we get out of here. Caleb wants to know, Whit Merrifield and Adam Duvall fits with the club. Seem like typical Mariners players. Could be good value with decent production upside. Adam Duvall, uh, like him, especially if you're uh, looking for a pairing there in left field with with Dominic Ganzone. I uh, really like the idea there with, with Duvall, who's probably going to make Judging from this market, the way that the market has fallen so far for, for bats in general, not just outfielders, 
six, seven million bucks for a year, mm-hmm. probably. Um, so the Mariners can definitely afford that. Duvall uh, had an insane start to the season, got hurt, unfortunately, but had a decent end to the season as well uh, for, for the Red Sox. Um, I think he's a good fit. Uh, power that should play uh, at T-Mobile Park, all that good stuff. So not really too concerned about how his bat would translate to Seattle. Uh, and then uh, Merrifield, I mean... I, my question, is Merrifield an upgrade over Dylan Moore? Okay, so that's what I was literally about to say. Is like I feel like the Mariners are going to look at Merrifield, and he might only cost like four or five million bucks, right? When yeah. this is all said and done, so it's not a whole lot. But the Mariners are on a budget. I think they probably look at him and go, "We're already spending three million dollars on Dylan Moore," and there's a decent chance that Dylan Moore is a better version of what Merrifield than what Merrifield is. I mean, they do it differently, right? Like. Yeah. Like Merrifield is contact and and mostly yeah. that, and Dylan Moore is swing out of my shoes in case I happen to make contact. Yeah. Um. But yeah, they both can steal a bag. They both can play a bunch of positions. Moore's probably a better defender in the infield than Merrifield at this stage. Mm. Um. There's just more upside in Dylan Moore's bat too. So, uh, I don't see Merrifield. I wouldn't be upset. Like if the idea is Merrifield is kind of the the 26 guy, fine. But you're already carrying. Uh, like just real fast, just to dispel this, Mitch Garver, stop looking at him. Stop looking at him as a catcher. You're not not carrying Sebi Zavala. Like you're not at least not get to cheeky start the with season. it. Yeah, you're not going to get cheeky with it and be like, oh, we only have one true catcher, and then like Garver will catch once a week. Like, why do you want to run Cal Raleigh into the ground? Yeah. No, they're they're gonna is... they're gonna they're gonna look at Zavala. Then you know if Zavala doesn't work out, they're probably gonna look at Blake Hunt. And yes, Garver's still yeah. going to be the DH. The reason I mentioned that is because again, Sebi Zavala is going to be on the bench. Dylan Moore is going to be on the bench as part of your platoon with Rojas, at least to start the year. If you're going to have a platoon partner with uh Canzone, right? Yeah. If that's not Merrifield, then you have one roster spot to play with on your bench. Is Merrifield the guy who makes the most sense for that? Maybe. Well, but uh, so like would I rather have what Merrifield than Jose Caballero, Sam Haggerty, et cetera. In a vacuum, sure, yes. but nothing works in a vacuum. Um, right. So would the Mariners want Whit Merrifield at $5 million or Jose Caballero on the league minimum or Sam Haggerty on essentially yeah. the league minimum? Yeah. Um, I, I think they would choose the latter, right? Because I don't I think do. there's a significant enough difference between Merrifield and Cabby. Or Merrifield and Haggerty. Yeah. That I makes mean, it I don't think it's a five million dollar difference. No, I don't think so. Um if you trade Dylan Moore, if he's a part of a deal, though, mm-hmm. then and maybe, they might although and they might, because that's might. three million dollars. Yeah. And three million dollars, well, it doesn't sound like a lot, and it's not relative to you know baseball. Mm-hmm. Um, it might be a lot to the Mariners. Yeah. Unfortunately, every dollar counts for Jerry DePoto this year. Yeah, yeah. So something to keep in mind. But um, yeah, I don't I I wouldn't expect that what Merrifield's going to be a Mariner no. when this is all said and done. Uh, but uh, Duvall, Duvall makes quite a bit of sense. So I like the Duvall idea. And I think he's someone they've checked in on before. Not too sure, mm-hmm. but I think they've checked in on him in the past. Yep. So there, there's some connection there. Kip wants to know, been thinking about this Cal Raleigh story where Brant Brown told Cal, if the game is telling you put a bunt down, put the bunt down. If it's telling you to move a runner, then move a runner. Do you think the M's will play more small ball in 2024? Well, Colby, as a big proponent of small ball, you love bunting. Big bunting guy over here, Colby Patnode, as we all know. Uh, what do you think about what Cal had to say about his conversation with Brant Brown? Uh, I'll sum it up in three words. Fire Brant Brown. How about that? Uh, no, I don't think that the mayors are going to play more small ball. I think that's more just about having a feel for the situation that you're in. Um, understanding that sometimes you don't need the, the, the home run, right? You don't have to swing out of your shoes. Sometimes you can, you can, you know, basically, you know, just put the ball in play is is more valuable than hitting a home run versus striking out like blah 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 right just about knowing the situation you're in situational hitting right yep it's something we've talked about and the mariners last year were terrible at situational hitting because they struck out so much so uh i i don't think this is all i don't think you're gonna see cal raleigh try to bunt for base hits next year like i don't think that's a thing No, no um i don't think scott service who doesn't bunt a lot he bunts too much which is 
any at all, but he doesn't bunt a ton. Uh, I don't think we're going to see them bunt. I don't think we're going to see more hit and runs. Uh, well, maybe you might see more hit and runs because they can actually make contact a little bit this year. But uh, no, I don't think this is a, a quote that's about, you know, like, hey, Cal Raleigh, you should just try and ground out to the second baseman so we can get the guy from second to third. Like, no, do damage, do damage, Cal. But yeah, yeah. there are times where the situation calls for you to just, you know, if the best you can do, O2 count, right? Whatever. And he gives you a pitch that you can roll over on and ground out to the second baseman. Just do it. If you get you a run, you know, I mean, it's just about situational hitting and understanding the moment that you're in and what's best for you or what's the best, you know, outcome for your success and for the s- success of the team in that moment with that pitch uh, that mm-hmm. you're seeing right there. So I think it's just about, you know, having good quality situational uh, hitting fundamentals and stuff like that. I don't think it's specifically right. a game plan that they're going to enact. This is a good opportunity to address something that uh, quite a few of our listeners were talking about in the um, comments of our mailbag episode, I think last week when we were talking a lot about Brent Brown. You know, he's considered to be the offensive coordinator. That's his title in Seattle. Uh, and so we got a lot of comments that are like, what, he's going to be in the skybox calling plays and blah, 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 blah. Here's a very easy, simple way to look at it. Brand Brown, offensive coordinator, he's working on situational stuff, situational hitting, stuff like that, game plans, right, for certain situations that crop up over the course of a game. Meanwhile, the hitting coach, Jared Hart, he's working on mechanics, stuff like that. That's what he, that's what his job is. And so that's essentially the difference between those two positions. Sure. Except Brown is going to have a hand in mechanical stuff. Like, he, they'll work together. He will too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, it's like obviously the quarterback a quarterback coach works with the offensive coordinator. Yeah. It's obviously a collaborative effort, but that's yeah. essentially the, the difference between those two positions. It's not, he's not calling plays, but he is crafting game plans. And we know that the Mariners did not look like they really had a game plan <laughs> offensively last year. Uh, and some very key situations just kind of looked like they were going up there and just vibing out and doing whatever they want to do. And some guys look like they were just kind of going rogue up there. So, uh, yeah, <coughs> <it'd be nice. coughs> Yeah, it'd be nice to actually have someone that kind of reels everyone in and, you know, has everyone on a on the same same track. That'd be nice. That'd be nice to see this year. So uh Brewer has a question here. Who in the bullpen should we be excited about the most next year besides Brash and Munoz? Uh Perlando Barroa has the highest yep. upside to be, you know, that third high leverage guy. So I would say him. Outside of Perlander, I would say Carlos Vargas. Carlos Vargas. Yeah, you got yeah, you got him in the it. yeah. There you go. You got him in the Eugenio Suarez trade, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, he's probably the second highest upside guy in, in the Mariners bullpen behind Barroa to be like an actual high leverage arm. So I'd say those two guys just because they have the upside for it. Now, will they live up to that upside? Who knows? Who knows? But those are the two guys that I would definitely keep an eye on who could be legitimate difference makers in the bullpen when we look back on twenty twenty four. Yeah, and we'll see if they add anybody else to the bullpen, but yep. a lot of the the Cody Boltons and type like that, not really that exciting. Uh, yep. it's but who Vargas. knows? It's the Mariners. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what, you don't write them off, but like none of those guys have like 99-mile-an-hour sinkers and wipeout sliders yep. like Perlander Barroa and, and Vargas have. So those are the two guys. Mm-hmm. Last question of the day comes from Ham Swaggerty 69. There has been a lot of discussion about the replacement if Wu slash Miller is traded. Would you guys be in favor of trading top prospects for a mid rotation guy like Dylan Cease or Corbin Burns or signing guys like Jose Quintana or James Paxson to a shorter deal? Uh, so, Colby, you've been a fan of trading prospects for an actual high end established starter. You've talked about Freddie Peralta. You've talked about Dylan Cease in the past. Not really Corbin Burns. And I don't think the Mariners would be too interested in Burns because it's only for one year. He's due 15 ish million dollars in arbitration last year of arbitration, of course. Uh, so that would eat a lot into what we assume they have in terms of money uh, remaining after the Garber deal. So yeah, I think Burns is off that list, but totally interested in a C steel, totally interested in a Freddie Peralta deal, something like that. Or maybe there's a pitcher that we haven't really talked about. That's actually available. Uh, that they could land uh, for prospects. But um, I I think if they did trade Wu Wu or Miller, it would be more so someone that's, you know, more in line with like James Paxson, Jose Quintana, et cetera, like that. Um, And I would definitely keep an eye on Paxson, though it looks like the the Red Sox are pretty interested in in, uh, bringing him back. So who knows? They might run out of time on that. 
first of all, uh, Cease and Burns don't belong in like the same category because Cease is significantly more valuable. He will cost top prospects because Burns, like you said, is a rental. Like yep. it's just different, right? Um, but like in terms of like, would they try and go and get like another Logan Gilbert type? If they could afford it, like in prospect capital, sure. I mean, yeah, yep. they, I think they would like to do that. But what's more likely to happen? It's probably the Paxton, Quintana, uh, Hijun Ru. Like, yeah, there's a few guys out there that could conceive. You're just looking for at that stage a two win starter. Yeah, that's what you're looking for because that's what's reasonable to expect from Bryce Miller. If you went out and you traded Logan Gilbert, you kind of have to go get Cease now. You kind of have to go get you know like a legitimate number three starter mm-hmm. um, to not lose a beat there. But for 2024 specifically, if you did trade Miller, then yeah, anybody you think is going to give you two wins is about what you should expect from Miller this upcoming year. So if you go out and you get a Quintana and he gives you 2.1 F4 season over 160 innings, yeah, that's probably about what was reasonable to expect from Miller. So you're probably, that's probably a, a even swap. So um, I, I guess I like the idea of them being involved in the pitching market, particularly if they can get a guy for prospects, which is why I bring up Freddie Peralta um, and why I haven't brought up a guy like Jesus Lazardo, who I would really like, but, Sounds like you're going to have to go up a major league piece to get them, particularly a shortstop. The Mariners don't have one to give. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I, I am very much in favor of just building the uh, screw you pitching staff, let's call it, and mm-hmm. uh, just leaning heavy on run prevention instead of trying to, you know, tilt at windmills and build a top five offense when that's just not really in the cards anymore. All right. Well, that's going to do it for our show. Thank you so much, everyone, for all of your questions. We really appreciate it. For Colby Patnoed, I'm Tyden Gonzalez. Be sure to give us a follow on Twitter at LO underscore Mariners. You can follow me at Ty Dane Gonzalez and Colby at CPAT11. That's CPAT11. You can also find all that stuff in the description of this episode. Thank you again for making us your first listen. Have yourself a beautiful baseball day, and we'll see you next time. Peace.